Hello, everybody. I would like to start with an anecdote. When we coordinated the chapter in Chile, we faced a series of interesting events. Obviously, we conducted lots of dissemination activities. We distributed, as you do, activists. We disseminated flyers in the streets, DVDs. We talked to many people. The thing is that when we started going I mean, further into activism, we realized that there was a serious problem, and there was that newcomers in the movement, I'm sure the same happened to you, in general, they didn't have soft, soft skills developed. If you don't know, soft skills are the social skills. I mean, how we communicate with people and how we connect with people. And therefore, we started realizing we have this problem of how we communicate the information, but we also have this problem that the people joining the organization did not meet certain skills in order to deliver the message and connect with people in a better way. So people were blocked when they received the information, particularly if you're speaking of such complex things as the resource-based economy or the things that are mentioned in the zeitgeist movement. So there we came up with an idea that basically was two guides. This is a crazy idea that uh, we thought of at the Chilean chapter, two guides to train the activist. The first guide The first guide talked about a system, an organized system of information that we gave to the activists so that they could uh, read it chronologically, including all the information available on the movement, because many started with the activist guide and then Peter Joseph's presentation, and was there was not much organization into it. And the other guy, the other guide, guide B, was um, rather a guide to train the new activists in how they should face the different listeners or recipients of the message, that we're going to receive the message, apart from presenting different environments. For instance, it's different to talk to a people on the street about the Z movement than talking to a people, to people at a party. I don't know if that happens to you. This happened to us very often. We used all the circumstances we could to transmit the information. So we were facing this problem. Of course, the project didn't move forward because, in fact, we thought there were too many variables to control. And finally, we decided to call off the project and terminate it because we could be called uh, like controllers that were implementing a strange control system. So we started to think. And one day, I was watching TV, and I found this movie. You must have seen it, perhaps. This is the, the Trojan horse uh, movie with Brad Pitt. Troy, it's called. And this uh, movie, Troy, describes the war in old Greece against the Trojans and how difficult it was to have access to that wall that Trojans had. And it took them 10 years, I mean, to wage this war, to find this battle, to have access to the city. I felt another warrior, another activist, trying to break that wall that is basically our target audience, people. How could we go into that city and break with the barriers of these people that are close to receiving new and different information? So I came up with the idea of 
this Trojan horse. But basically, this is what the movie describes, the Trojan horse myth. I mean, the Greek, after trying and trying, couldn't break into the city, and eventually <laughs> Ulysses came up with the idea of leaving this horse on the verge of the shore, and then they left with the army to a nearby island, and they left the horse there as a gift to the gods. And then the Trojans came to the horse and realized that it was a kind of a gift, and they took it to the city. Of course, I imagine you, you know the story. But eventually, the walls were, I mean, broken into by the, the Greeks, and the old um, Greeks managed to break into the city and finally conquer that uh, city it was a mission they have managed they had wanted to achieve for a long time so i thought wouldn't it be a good idea to do the same so art is a trojan horse and here we found perhaps as activists of the z movement an interesting piece the missing piece perhaps so as to have access and break with that wall it was so difficult to penetrate. I mean, those people that do not know the information, perhaps many of you are not aware of the Z movement. This is the first time you hear about it. But when you receive the information and you go deeper into it, it's very difficult to accept the information at the first try. So that might be the key. Could it be the key, the Trojan horse? Finally, this uh, leads us to the next crossroads, how we face the challenge as activists. In fact, we're not proposing anything new. I mean, these things have been used by the system to introduce messages without us realizing that through movies, advertising, and many other tools that have to do with art as well. But in this case, in the case of the system, very often, not always, they have a negative approach, rather directed to consumerism and the market. So we wanted to give it a different approach. Art and its participation in social changes. First, what is art? The term art comes from the word Latin, ars, and, and the Greek word that means production or material manufacturing. It's understood as any activity with an aesthetic and communicative purpose through which ideas are expressed, emotions, and in general, a vision of the world. In old times, art was conceived as the expertise and the ability to produce something. And since the late 15th century, during the Renaissance, for the first time, there's a distinction between the artist and the artist and the craftsman, the art and the fine arts, and the artist as a producer of single and irrepeatable works. And so the liberal arts were separated from what we now call the fine arts. These are the sculptures, painters, architects. With the evolution of technology, other things were added like photography, movie making, literature. We might say that art has gone through several transformation processes. For instance, the religious mentality that prevailed in the 14th, from the 7th to 14th century conditions the value of artistic expressions of the time through religion, Christianity, Islam, etc. And here, art is a way of honoring God. And in the contemporary age, this is broken, given way to a multiplicity of artistic movements and styles that are different and subjectivism and individualism prevail. There we can appreciate some works of contemporary art. And then art has been generally accompanied by the feeling and the spirit of the time reflecting a certain proportionality or, or mirror effect of the human feeling, whether shown religious devotion, social injustices, political conflicts, or 
the simplicity in the sadness of a love uh, mishappiness that is the feeling of a people. Now, it is possible that art, just our old and modern goddess, was constructed uh, in a similar way as our fears, our needs, or those things that we cannot control. Perhaps the gods of the first civilized humans had to do with nature, as in the case of Poseidon, the Greek god. That basically had to do with nature. He was the god of the seas and earthquakes, of the Egyptian god Seth the god of trout and chaos and then with the mm, emergence of agriculture and the advancement of science and technology particularly the technique of agriculture a new problem comes up the environment is dominated I mean the environment meaning nature but the problem is man so Perhaps the human of the future, or the god of the future, he corrects himself, has to do with something new. Perhaps it has to do with technology. If we overcome the problems of nature, for instance, what problems are we going to face in the future? What will be the form of that new god? This is what I wonder. And there we had some examples of gods like Jesus, Muhammad, or Buddha that are examples or representations of the projection of the needs, of human needs, or the fears projected in the desire of something perfect or idyllic. The role of art may be divided into three parts in summary, educational, communicational, and leisure or entertainment. The need to educate is something very important. Now I would like to say that in this case, it doesn't have, I mean, art doesn't have an intrinsic property in itself. It's more an enabler. An example of this might be rock paintings. These are the first artistic expressions of humankind, and these wall paintings like Altamira in Spain, that depicted the most important pictorial and artistic cycles of history. They are estimated to be at least 15,000 years old. It is said that these wall paintings might imply an educational method to teach the youngest about hunting and identifying the possible animals that might be available for feeding purposes. The truth is that most of these artistic applications might be related to religious and this connects us with what we said before about gods and human needs. In the Middle Ages, the ruling classes, like the religious orders, commissioned uh, artists to represent most of the population that were not able to read and write. This is a representation of art that is very related to religion. And basically, this was in order to educate people. and transmitting the idea of the religion without having the language. I mean, through art, they could communicate and transmit their system of values. This was very notorious in Latin America in general. For instance, what happened with the syncretism that was basically combining two different cultures, two different gods, mixing them so as to establish a connection and then gradually introduce ne this new thinking. And therefore, when we speak of art in education, we are speaking about improving the tools 
that we need to defend ourselves from external threats or just adapt to the environment around us. Art doesn't have an intrinsic educational role. It's rather a tool that makes us see the information as more attractive. The second role is communication. In the Middle Ages, the big protagonists of popular music were popular artists. Many times they travel from town to town to tell a story or a scandal in the court life. There are differences between them, but that's something they shared was the purpose to entertain by transmitting a message. These messages went from court life, particularly the love affairs or the great heroic legends of the medieval knights, and also these uh, troubadours or jonglers. So as I said, we might say that these uh, minstrels never disappeared, but rather they evolved the way of expressing the social discontent. Art is a beautiful way of expressing a message. Not only that, art has the power of breaking with the defenses and connecting with the <coughs> deepest emotions in the human being, and achieving that is an art in itself. So in literature, for instance, that is the art of verbal expression, we find words that have changed the world in social terms. For instance, here we have some important examples. The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, and Adolf Hitler with, with My Fight. These are just examples to show you what can be achieved by a text. Then we have the case of the feminist revolution. We have the second uh, sex by Simone de Beauvoir, and also somebody that perhaps is not so popular, but a person who was the first woman that spoke about feminism, Mary Wollstonecraft, in 1792. She already spoke about the rights of women through a book called The Vindication of the Rights of Women. She was English. New times will bring new representations of the human feeling, and we think that they might transform, I mean, into new texts and new bestsellers, in a way. And this mm, mm, might lead to the future. When the time comes, they might generate an important revolution and a change of mindset. Perhaps it's not the time yet, but we are moving in that direction. However, it seems that the deep changes we need uh, today are very slow. We think, we think we can do something more. Something is tying us to the floor, something that is stopping us from advancing in activism. What is happening? It's not enough to make a couple of demonstrations a year. We have to do something more. The world of today is accelerated, it's overstimulated. There's no more ability to contemplate and persevere. But what is the reason for this overstimulation? Why we are increasingly distracted, everything is more intense. Krishnamurti said very simply, this is not, it's not a sign of good health to be well adapted to a deeply sick society. And finally, we don't have the need to entertain. We have the need to entertain. It plays a significant role in society. That also alleviates this tension in society. It's very necessary. It tends to improve society. The, in old times, they saw that nature was an expression of the divine, and the desire to imitate it was a way of connecting with the goddess. That was the origin of dance. They say that the chaman of the world added dance and added the drums to mark the, pul mark the pulse of the planet. The chaman drum 
had a special role to connect with nature, but also it played a medicinal role. Many of these, I'm going to summarize it, but many of these techniques, medicinal techniques, rather traditional, are not possibly seen by people with a harder scientific analytical approach. But in those cases where medicine cannot reach places of uh, low resources, it's the only way for them to feel better. So we shouldn't be so bad at this. I mean, we shouldn't look at this in a negative uh, way. We should analyze the context, rather. Stress is the disease of the 21st century. As ordinary citizens, we normally don't go to a chaman, of course. We go to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, but this is the final option. So what do we have available to fight stress? Basically, books and movies, TV series, that is what we have handy, and this is what we use the most in order to relax. The problem is basically that there is an overstimulation from mass media in general and from uh, cinema, TV, Netflix, etc. And we end up, I mean, <coughs> it shifts the true role of art that should be a therapeutic element to alleviate our stress and it becomes the opposite something negative that ties us to the media and this creates a mass of consumers and, and passive viewers that don't have a critical thinking of their own i call this is the mouse wheel this is this is the system that most people live in every day. Here we can see that in Chile, for instance, most of us get up at 6 a.m., go to work at 8, we work until 7 p.m., then we commute for an hour, and we get back home at 8 p.m., we eat at 9 p.m., we see it to our personal affairs at 10 p.m., and finally, we watch a TV show, at, uh, I mean, something that is popular, and of course, well, sex or a lot, lot of advertising, and then cycle is repeated. So how can we come out of this mouse wheel? The only way is basically, in my opinion, by having an impactful message. This is not a very nice image, but deep, I mean, this is what I really want to express. Sometimes it's not enough with disseminating information in a simple way. We have to be more impactful. And finally, how do we connect people, um, art, sorry, with information or science to deliver a powerful message? And integrating the therapeutic role, but with some content. Some historical references now, very quickly. These are our true Trojan, Trojan horses, art, for instance, urban art. Here we try to raise awareness with these uh, graffitis, these wall paintings in Chile, and I think we share this issue with Mapuches, with Argentina. There are lots of struggles among the Mapuche, the Aboriginal population, and the feminist um, revolution, Banksy, that is an artist, an urban artist that became famous recently because one of his arcs was auctioned and was self-destroyed. I don't know if you've seen that. In music, we have big names like John Lennon, Bob Dylan, Bob Mar uh, Marley, Leon Hicko, Pink Floyd with The Wall, of course, an important record, Violeta Parra. In photography, we, this is also very important uh, art, very interesting. 
here we can see a general, an, an army officer from Viet Cong is killing a person, a leftist from Vietnam that was fighting for his rights, something similar to what is happening in Venezuela. That person had killed 34 people from the other side, and at that moment, well, he was captured and he was shot in the head, and that was recorded. This picture was taken by Kevin Carter. It was controversial because the photographer then left the place and he was criticized for that in one uh, prize with this picture, but then the photographer killed himself. This is a picture of a person, a sailor kissing a woman, a nurse. And this it ends up being that, the, I mean, this kiss has been forced on the woman. I would like Okay, we have books, we have documentaries. Here we have an example of a happy world by, and that shows that uh, money can buy it all. Um, then some more movies, the, the Matrix. So the question is, what about video games? How much can they Im influence society? We'll try to move quickly. So the question that we ask ourselves, our after all these uh, journeys, what about video games? Are they art? There is a big controversy regarding video games. A lot of critics say that they as, um, want to be art, but as audiovisual media, but they cannot be compared to paintings by um, Michelangelo or by some other type of uh, famous, renowned piece of art. But with all these, we are trying to say that a video game can have the role of raising awareness and conveying a message through the game. This war of mine, for instance, is a game based on the Bosnia capital city war in Barsaya. And, and here, different situations are portrayed. Uh, the players have to find uh, medication, objects, um, so here you have multiple characters playing at the same time. You have to use different characters, not just only one. These are different people at the same time. And you can see the problems that each individual may encounter. This is another game based on actual facts on actual events, Lila and the Shadows of War. This is a family that uh, suffered the consequences of war in the Gaza Strip, and it shows the level of suffering, people who die, the people they meet. It is quite a powerful story that ultimately leads to think why these kind of situations happen and it also puts you to think about what is happening in other places around the world. Why do we want to use video games and not some other means? We could have chosen a documentary film, a feature film, a book. But the first answer is that after doing a lot of research into this, we realize that there is a difference between video games and books and films, and that is that through a book you can learn a lot, you can be creative, but you will not be taking an actively leading role. You are just an observer. 
but you don't have that experiential role. So for us, the Trojan horse means this, how we can convey a message uh, using a video game that can instill um, these thoughts into somebody's mind and without going against this individual's uh, system of values because it happens often in Chile. Sometimes we are like evangelists trying to evangelize and convey our message, our belief of the way to change this world, but this may go or may clash against the values of other people. So we realized that a kinder way of conveying the message is just by playing, by through entertainment, enjoying life, doing it sub in a subtle manner without going against people's values. So now we are going to play a video on what we are working on. This is our video game project. So this will help you understand what the we are universe. doing. Its immensity makes me feel tiny. It looks so lonely. It's a bit like me. Maybe that's why, since I was little, it's intrigued me so much. Even in all that apparent solitude, cold and distant, inhabit millions of galaxies. It is absurd to think there is no other planet similar to this one with complex beings like us. Right now I am investigating a particular planet. Recent discoveries reveal that it could harbor intelligent life, even more advanced than ours. I imagine they have already overcome wars, poverty, and suffering in general. But have they managed to travel to other planets? If so, will they have visited ours? I want to believe they have. If only there was a way to communicate with them. I just have to arm myself with courage. Wait, what am I saying? Why would they be interested in knowing about me? I'm not very special, nor very important. I must stop fantasizing. Anyway, here I have everything I need. But why does this strange feeling persist? And these recurring dreams? Do they have any meaning? 